coming, Samara. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, it was lovely meeting you last year um, and being able to work with you. And I'm going to delve into the success I know you've had since, <laughs> sort of during and since <laughs> the Academy. Um, so basically, at the start of 2021, what made you uh, apply to the Academy? I'm like, 2021, I don't remember much. <laughs> 2021, 2022, it's all a bit of a blur. Um, so applying for the Academy, I was originally uh, one of the members of the Westwards Writing Residency at Varuna. Um, and so when we finished that and we're giving feedback and James Roy was like, uh, you know, we were discussing our next steps. So what's available, what can Westwards do to help me as a writer go on to the next step? And uh, I came up with Westwards Fellowship and Westwards Academy, so they were mentioned. And then so when 2021 came around, uh, Michael like emailed and said, hey, this is applications are opening, would you like to join? And I was like, sure, I'll do it. And yeah, now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, tell us a little bit about um, your creative works um, before joining the Academy, what were you were writing? Okay, um, so I've been writing for a while, just on and off, kind of playing with it, and the last few years I took it a bit more seriously. Um, started to query manuscripts and things like that, wrote a few books, and I landed my agent at the end of last year, during the end of the Academy year. And Congratulations. That was my, thank you. That was on my third um, book, and then also uh, did the, um, sorry, Found some critique partners and all of that. Um, made some good mentors, so like Mary Robinette Cowell and Isabel Camodi is currently a mentor. Uh, I just love Mary really Robinette. She is amazing. <laughs> so she's taught me a lot about writing and just giving me lots of tips. And when I had my Asian call, she was like my first point of call, and mm. she just dealt with all my stress. Mm. And <laughs> she was amazing. She's just like, I was like, I'm getting a call with my agent. I don't know what to do. And like this was when they offered. And then Mary Robinette was like, do you want to go on a video call? I can call you right now. And I went, yes, please. And then, yeah. So she was just there to keep me. To, to put that into <laughs> perspective, Mary Robinette Cowell is an American um, sci-fi writer, incredibly well respected, a Nebula Award winner. So that, that's incredible <laughs> that you've been working with her. Yeah, accidentally stumbled into her sphere of writing. <laughs> yeah, it's been amazing. Um, so, uh, what have you brought to, no, before I jump into that, um, so last year during the Academy, uh, what was there a major work you were developing across all the workshops and seminars? Uh, yeah, so one of them is the one that I'm working, revising with my agent right now, um, which it's a middle grade fantasy, which I won't talk about much yet because we're planning to do things with it. Um, because it's under contract. <laughs> <laughs> and then with the Westwards uh, Fellowship, which I got last year, um, working with Isabel Camodi on another middle grade fantasy, and that's about um, Ashlyn Charming. She is Cinderella and Prince Charming's daughter. And basically, their family's happily ever after gets stolen, and she has to go on a quest to get it back. So that's the basic premise. <laughs> Great. Um, but I understand that you're reading something different. From really us. different. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm reading a flash fiction that was published recently in Daily Science Fiction. Uh, it's a dystopian setting about a girl who's kind of going to school in a dystopian world. So. Wonderful. Do you want me to All right, yes, that? without further ado, I'll, All right. I'll let you do your reading. Cool. So, last team standing. Three students. That's how many of us show up today. Last week, there were four. Class gets smaller every time, but we still gotta come. I don't remember being this excited back when school was all moldy to mountables with creaky ceiling fans. It's the practical, hands-on learning that has me hooked. Our teacher, Mrs. Hyde, makes every subject relevant. She still teaches us the classics, like, how long is that piece of wood? Mathematics. Where was it found? Geography. Is it from the strongest type of tree left? Biology. I study hard to make mum proud. Top of the class, last, teen last teenager standing and all that. I try to ace every subject, except history. Mrs. Hyde wants us to learn from it, but in truth, no one wants to remember the before. Sometimes, Mum and I talk about that day though, the day solar flares hit. Warm spring air, perfumed with lavender, 
A roast in the oven, crackling with occasional pop. Politicians with polished hair and press suits choking up the news. Stay calm, it's business as usual. Their flowery speeches could have talked Mother Teresa out of sainthood. Experts join them behind the podiums and dazzled us with science. The sun gets angsty all the time. Our planet's magnetic field will protect us. The other timer buzzed when the satellites went. No internet, fuzzy television, and a phone that always got the busy signal. After the first few minutes of awkward silence, it was like learning to talk again. I didn't know Mum could be so funny. Then the power cut. Family dinner by candlelight, followed by board games. That didn't sound too bad. No one thought twice about the nuclear power plants. Turned out, they needed electricity to keep their cooling pumps running. Things turned a little uncouth for a bit after that. Mum said it happens when everyone is suspicious of everyone and all humanity is hungry. It's the animal in us. We forget we're evolved species. We went from clubs to tools and eventually the wheel. Yet it only took one geomagnetic storm to hit reset. At least we got to reinvent school. Every day is a field trip. Sure, the hazmat suit gets a bit stuffy, the deradiated water tastes salty, and lunch is the same old beefy liquid in a pouch. But my classroom is now the sunburnt country that some poet raved about back in great great something something brands day. Mrs. Hyde is smiling today. The burning sun turns her hazmat suit canary yellow. It matches the chirpiness in her voice when she yells, surprise physics quiz! My heart races, hands sweat, breath fogs my vision. I hate surprises. I love quizzes. <laughs> then she asks, how much force is needed to knock down a mass of, say, a 50 kilogram teenager accelerating away from you? I grin and eye my classmates while hefting the answer in my hand. It depends on the club. Good to see you again. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself outside of creative pursuits. Okay, um, I'm a primary school teacher and I'm also a sacramental coordinator, so I do the two jobs part-time um, and somewhere in there I find time to write. <laughs> we, we all got to force it in, don't we? Um, so, it's the start of 2021. Um, why do you apply to the Westwoods Academy? Um, I subscribed to the Westwoods newsletter. I had been, I'd attended a few um, things that were offered when Haja was here. And um, so I just keep my eye on anything that's happening in Western Sydney mm -hmm. to do with, with, with writing. Great. And across the year, um, this is not a question I gave you ahead of time, um, but uh, <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> just to throw you under the bus. Um, but uh, are you able to tell us a little bit about what you got out of the program, um, or your best takeaways over the twelve months? Okay. Um, I guess my best takeaways are the facts of finding about finding out about the business of writing, about grants about tax. <laughs> My husband's probably in shock that I'm interested in tax. Um, <laughs> just to know, I now have a writing tax folder with receipts mm -hmm. and a bunch of other things in there. Um, part of that because my picture book came out last year, so I've needed to have um, myself in order for next year's tax. And congratulations on your picture book. Thank um, you. Would you like to tell us about that and how that came about? Okay, um, a picture book star <laughs> came out last year, mm -hmm. right in the middle of lockdown, mm -hmm. and I was so glad to be part of Westwards because I was able to have a few Westwards academians there with me on the um, online launch, which was a steep learning curve. Um, it's a Christmas picture book, the story of a star who's tiny and um, doesn't shine or twinkle as much as the other stars. Um, and being a Christmas story, when they, when the star looks down and sees um, Mary on the donkey, um, he's, it's not a he, it's, it's an it. <laughs> um, feels such compassion that it 
begins to grow and grow and grow and shine and it's the star that lights the way through the rest of the Christmas story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and would you like to briefly um, plug your book? Um, where are you able to get a copy? Um, it's, you can buy it at Little Pink Dog Books online, but it's also um, on pretty much anywhere, Amazon, Booktopia, and um, Dimix. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and for your reading tonight, what will you be reading? So for my reading tonight, I'm doing the work, one of the works that I, the picture books that I was working on during last year. Um, it was one I sent to Alison Fraser. Um, we were really lucky to have a couple of editors. <coughs> we had several editors, but a couple of them were um, picture book editors. And so this is the picture book I worked on with Alison. Excellent. Um, and as it is a picture book, yeah, we've got pictures. pictures. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> oh, that's <laughs> that's, that's, that's <laughs> <about it. laughs> straight to Netflix. <laughs> okay. Um, without further ado. Thank you. Several stately giraffes gathered grazing on the low-lying leaves of the tallest trees surrounding the town square. They discussed, measured, and bent their long necks in agreement. They had been chosen to be the new town monument. A parliament of owls looked on. Giraffes! Giraffes! said an owl. Surely we can do better than that. For once, they all agreed. Yes, they said, we must. So the Parliament of Owls spoke to the lions. For our town monument, we should do better than giraffes on their spindly stilts. Sure, they're stately. Some might even say elegant. But we need something stronger, more regal, like you or us. <laughs> Although the lions knew the giraffes were the right choice, their pride got in the way and they agreed. Lemurs joined the conspiracy and ferrets made it their business to bring those giraffes down a peg or two. The flamingos, flamingos alone took a stand, refusing to be part of this ridiculous mob. <laughs> the emus took offence and chased the flamingos away in all their flamboyance. This set off the wildebeest and in the confusion, a lone wombat slipped away. Their plan well in place now. The owls called a caravan of camels and several casts of falcons to set up an elaborate stage for the new Newtown Monument. Wearing such a quiver of excitement is the cobras while the tigers set up an ambush. Meanwhile, the wombats had called on the moles who laboured hard alongside them, undermining the lemurs' conspiracy. The building in the town square continued to grow rapidly, thanks to the zebra's zeal, and it looked as though the giraffe monument might be doomed. The next morning there was pandemonium, as parrots screeched and crows called murder. <coughs> Overnight, wildcats' destruction had reigned though they shared no loyalty with the giraffes or anyone else. They were simply playing, as cats, no matter their size, like to do. And the wisdom of wombats nodded their approval as all that remained standing and nibbling the tallest branches of the tallest sur trees surrounding the town square was a tower of giraffes gently swaying in the breeze. Joining us, Belle. Thank you. Good to see you again. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you have several creative pursuits, yes, other than writing. Yes, um, I'm a writer and a uh, singer songwriter um, and a sometime photographer, and I do like to kind of cross them over occasionally. I often explore different themes um, um, across those different art forms or the same themes across those different art forms. So, um, it's the start of 2021, uh, why do you apply for the Westwoods Academy? <laughs> uh, 
Um, I think there might be a few in here. I'm a full-time mum <laughs> and have been for the last eight years. And when uh, 2021 came around, I spoke with James Roy, who also lives in the Blue Mountains and works the Westwards. And he encouraged me to apply for this academy. Um, it sounded like a great way to get back into writing and reconnect with the sector. So I've kind of had a bit of a hiatus while having kids and being a parent. So that's the reason why. <laughs> and were you successful in that, being able to connect? <laughs> well, COVID hit and I had yeah. to homeschool kids. <laughs> but um, no, actually, it was a great excuse to carve out that time. And, um, which I did on the weekends during the seminars and make space for writing again. So yes, it absolutely did help with that. And did you have a major work you were developing across last year? I, I did, I kind of split it, it uh, I had two. I was, um, I've been working on a novel manuscript for many years. It started before I um, had kids and then it kind of stopped because of having kids. And then I found it a lot easier to write um, short, really short stories, a bit uh, similar to Samara, this um, flash, flash fiction. And I used my photography to um, give me a bit of inspiration there. So I was working on some flash fiction responding to photographs. Um, but I, I also delved back into the novel over that time, for sure. Great. Um, and you, are you able to tell us a little bit about that work, its themes? Why it's important to you? The novel? <laughs> <laughs> the novel. Yeah. The novel um, is set in a fictionalised version of Wiseman's Ferry. Um, some of you might know where that is. Um, and uh, I think the, the idea came when I visited once and was crossing the river on the ferry and I was just watching the ferry driver wondering about his life. And then it kind of snowballed and it, it's ended up being um, really a story about change and loss and how I suppose with all change there must be some grieving of loss. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us what stage that project's at and what future plans you have for it. Um, well as I said there's quite yeah. a big break so just before I had my first child I I came runner-up in an award, and that was just a manuscript award. Um, and I sort of felt like I had a trajectory, and then I've had this big break. But um, I just received the Westwards Fellowship this year as well, um, and that's really propelled me back into it. So um, I'm working with an amazing author, Delia Faulkner. If you haven't heard of her, you should check her out <laughs> if you like literary fiction in particular. Um, and um, we're just working on revising it now hopefully to a point at which I can then feel comfortable sending it out to, to publishers. So yeah, hopefully by the end of this year I'll be looking at doing that. Excellent. Um, would you like to introduce the excerpts that you're reading? Yes, yeah, so I will read the prologue of my novel manuscript. And I know prologues are not particularly fashionable these days. Um, so it's not actually even called prologue, it's called before. Um, and it does come before uh, chapter one. <coughs> <coughs> on a day when the dandelions drooped and even the natives curled and cowered the townsfolk of Sullivan's Ferry still gathered on Main Street for the annual sending off that hat waving, finger whistling bat padding corridor that welcomed the kindy kids to their first day of school <coughs> of course it was only the retired, the artists the under or unemployed who made it and often they snuck in warnings like no turn back now, kid, or welcome to the rest of your life. But there was enough colour and noise to keep the procession focused forwards. The kids marched on ahead, or they were dragged along by the over-enthusiastic arm of a parent. They followed their broad chests, or they retreated into the privacy of their curled backs. They smiled or sobbed. But they all went through the same corridor, and they all found themselves in the same foreignness of an undressed classroom while the townsfolk returned to the familiarity of their TVs and fans. A woman in beige shepherded the kid, buzzing kids into sitting formation. She stood at the front of the room, adjusted her bra and called for hush. She had a surprise for them, and she clapped her hands and retreated to the back where the humidity made a sticky mess of her inner thighs. Now at the front, there stood a man in a black suit with tails that could drag any one of those kids across the room and out the door if they held on tight enough, 
out into the world as big and mysterious as the man's empty hands, though none of them thought to give it a try, too busy watching those hands, that needable space. The man in the suit bowed and took off his hat, and the kids stared into the empty bowl of it until they lost interest in the black uniformity of nothing. By now, they had forgotten it was their last day of school, that a woman who was not their mother still watched the backs of them. In a cross-legged herd, they scratched the parts of themselves that had grown itchy from this weight, picked their own mysterious cavities for things they could touch, feel, things that were real, that could be trapped in the pinch of a nail and fed to the paddock of musty carpet beneath. Some of them were pulling the fluff from their socks when it happened, so that later all they remembered was the shifting of shadows. And even those who were not distracted, those who watched closely, witnessed little more than just this. The swift snap of a black cloth, blink, that unremarkable hat. And now, wide-eyed and nervous, a rabbit jumping right out of the black nothing of it. The kids bucked and seesawed to let the laughter out, clapped wide-fingered and stuffed handfuls of air down their throats, while the rabbit hopped about their scabby knees, flinching out of headlocks, until finally landing in the open lap of Cole Parker. Cole held his breath for as long as he could, still as a bridge tree root, and the rabbit stayed put, tucked in the crook of him. It twitched and trembled but did not move so Cole could feel the small heart of it thumping against his calf, the hot life of it against his skin. And even when he did breathe, when he let his own life be felt, the rabbit just sat there and accepted it. The kids cooed and crawled over each other to get closer to the quiet boy with the rabbit in his lap. Give us a go, give us a go. They bounced on their haunches and made whale sounds out of cordial stained lips. They pulled the hair in front of them and kicked the knees behind them, but Cole didn't notice any of it, only this pulsing life under his soft palm, the twiggy ribs of it at his fingertips, the careful hand of the girl sitting next to him descending and cupping the rabbit's ears, and the great solid weight of himself grounded to the earth beneath. So when the man with the coattails waded through the reedy torsos of swaying kids and paused at the planted knees of coal and the outstretched arm of the girl, when the shifting shadow stopped and cast itself right over the top of them, he didn't notice this either. It was only when the rabbit was gone, when the air was suddenly cold against his new skin, that he felt the clammy hangover of this change. Now, there was just the black back of a strange man his trailing tails, the small table at the front of the room, and an empty glass box on top of it. The smell of meat pies wafted over from the lunch tray, and the teacher aired her face with a wad of napkins. The man stuffed the rabbit into the glass box. The kids chewed on the fat of their finger pads. It was all hush <laughs> and held breath, but for the rhythmic panting of the ceiling fan above, and Cole's own small heart thumping wildly against his chest. The hot flood of it was already at the brim of his eyes. Then that black shadow swooped down again, snapped and gulped the moist air, and those kids gulped too, and sucked it in and held onto it so long that it flowered in their lungs. Blink. The rabbit was gone. Vanished. And now in its place was a quivering white bird. So the children spilled over themselves and squealed and rocked and blew petals from their pent-up lungs at the feet of the man who had made it happen, who had turned a rabbit into a bird right before their open eyes. Every one of them, even the girl with the gentle hand, was raised to their toes and thrust forward to see, to be sure that it was true, this transformation of fur into feather. Every one of them, except for Cole Parker, who sat there, still as a stump on his spot, unmoved, letting the flies land, stuffing closed fists into his empty lap and trying not to cry for what was gone. <laughs> Um, so I, I had success and luck in um, writing screenplays, getting those produced. Um, 
and it's a very collaborative world uh, to the point where I was missing out on the opportunity to write my own stuff. That makes sense. I was more of a, a gun for hire writer. Um, and there were some stories that I wanted to tell that weren't screenplays. I knew they were prose, that they had to be a book. Um, so around 2019, I got more serious about trying to teach myself prose writing, how to write a book, because that's a very scary prospect um, coming from a 90-page screenplay to a 300-page manuscript of two completely different beasts. Um, and so I started looking for opportunities that were out there, um, what I could access, and uh, through a friend recommendation, I stumbled across the West Wales Academy and applied. Yes, and in fact, that friend is a mutual friend who I had worked with previously, so I'm pretty surprised that you know, she found a way after that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, but what did you get out of the Academy? I think I got a job out of it. <laughs> um, uh, but aside from that, um, I, I went from kind of grasping at the fringes of being an emerging writer to coming out the other end feeling firmly embedded in the emerging writing community. Um, I, I just thoroughly enjoyed the, the networking that came out of it, meeting my fellow writers, um, forming writing groups, being able to talk about our processes and that, um, because writing can be incredibly isolating and you think you're the only person in the world with that specific problem, um, but then you talk to another writer and it's an incredibly universal problem to have. Um, so it, it does take something that's quite isolating and makes it a community misery event? No, but it's <laughs> <laughs> um, So that, that was definitely my biggest takeaway, and I wanted, to, uh, after the Academy, to remain involved. Um, so a part of that was when I saw the position being advertised, applying for it. Um, but then also now as a programmer at Westwards, um, it's a prerogative of mine to keep the alumni involved. Uh, so it's not so much a, you've had your 12 months here, out the door, it, it's keeping in contact with the pool of writers we're always working with, bringing them back and fostering that community. Yes. Because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's wonderful, but it's also uh, that going back to what I was saying before about the needs, the building of community is so important. So really happy that that's what's been developed, what's happening tonight. So what were you working on last year? So, um, I was working on a <coughs> black comedy historical fiction manuscript. Um, it's an idea that I had perhaps been sitting on for five years, but hadn't like had the motivation to dive into it yet, or the encouragement to. So I actually started writing, like, pen down first draft March last year. And it, it was a fairly um, all-consuming process in that I had the first draft written in three months and then I've been viciously editing it since. Um, it's based on the true story of an Australian convict in what I think is a rather undertold um, story of a thrice-escaped Australian convict. Um, and just the more research I did into his crazy adventures, I was astounded that we had never heard of this figure, in that we, we have dozens and dozens of the Ned Kelly tale, but we don't have many of this tale. Um, and I think kind of part of the outrage I felt at, why have we not heard of this figure, is what ultimately created the main character, who has this axe to grind about being remembered and not being erased. And if that's what we're going to hear a bit from you. It is. So let's hear a bit from you. Okay. Um, this is the beginning. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this reading requires a hat. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> They're still <laughs> gone. <laughs> Next time. Chapter one, The Liberty. Come all you sons of freedom, a chorus join with me. I'll sing a song of heroes and glorious liberty. Frank the Poet. London, November, 1830. William Swallow never called himself a swindler, but that'd be uncomfortably close to the truth, and Will was a better liar than that. 
Perhaps it was this affinity, a mutual trade in disguise, that he sensed from the old Bailey. It was a building resolute in reputation, determined to control the impression of every man it courted, whether summoned within its walls by consent or not. Elevated at the far end of the court were the three black robed Your Honours. They sat at their bench ridiculously bewigged, taking up more room than there were. They suited the hall's grand size and decor. Velvet and stone copulated freely over arch windows, birthing Edwardian Baruch sensibilities. Marble pillars loomed as if eager to intimidate or bolster those who'd long ago confused outward dress for true authority. Will stood at the bar, wrists fidgeting in irons. He was aware of the four prisoners in rank behind him, rattling their footlocks in a way which grated the nerves. But to turn and chastise them as a captain would his crew, to see their faces now, may cause him to waver from what he must do. This jury would not acquit five men, but on his luck, freedom may be granted to one. Not too deep beneath Will's skin, indelicately twined between the ventricles of his heart, was the fervent desire to survive. Formerly, the thought of existing without his family had not seemed a survival worth crediting. But with his mortality on trial, an inner animalistic hunger clawed for his preservation. If these judges were to steal his life, crushing his windpipe and vertebrae with a short jerk, Will would take comfort in knowing that he'd done all he could to see his name live on after him. That was, perhaps, the sentiment of a man who'd confused infamy for love. The Crown Barrister stood and began his address. Announced as Dr. William Whiteman, Will felt a momentary pang of resentment for the man's mother, who, like his own, had looked down at her red-faced, squalling newborn and somehow felt compelled to add another common William to the world. Mm -hmm. Piratically and feloniously setting upon, breaking and entering a certain vessel to wit a brig called the Cypress, Whitman declared. To recall the cypress prompted a sour wound. She'd been a good breed, reliable and earnest, and had preserved Will and his men through torment, bravely crossing the globe's oceans to seek him home to his family. By her leave, he'd proven himself the navigator and captain few believed could come of his stock. And he had failed her. Now she lay scuttled and left to barnacle half a world away. The changed men behind him had known her just as well, and only with great fortitude could Will successfully detach from his equal affection for them. They'd rallied to his cause, for like him, their instinct was to refuse their prescribed lot. They'd striven for more and taken what was not given. They too were gripped by the vice of mutiny. William Swallow, Whiteman said, and glanced down at his papers. That is what we are to call you, not the alias of Brown, not Shields, not Waldron, not Todd, not, Whiteman checked his notes again, not Walker. Will flinched at the last. A true name was an easy scab to bleed, but seeming not to notice the blow he'd dealt, Whiteman carried on. From Sunderland, born in 1792, impossible, interrupted another barrister, John Adolphus. Dad make him 38. The lad doesn't appear a day over 27. The saltair has preserved me. The sentence escaped Will before it could be held. Bill, is it? Do you prefer Bill? Adolphus asked. Not particularly. Bill, no seafarer I've ever known looks younger than his years. Older, more like. The jurors, seated in the stalls, tittered. Enough, Whiteman was attempting to wrangle a court that, less than a few minutes in, had already lost its heading. Will had seen the inside of enough courts to be familiar with correct proceedings and had endured enough plays to recognize a farce. Was it a leading man they wanted? William Swallow, the one they'd never kept captured. If God truly did punish the sinner, then he'd plainly forgotten about Will. Your plea, the other William asked. Not guilty. Will's answer, which was counterintuitive to prescribed legal advice, rippled a stir through the justice hall. Many of the clerks below the judge's bench, bench took to shaking their heads. One fellow had his face in his hands, and Will belatedly recognised him as his own counsel. The presiding <laughs> judge, where William Bolland, leaned forwards. I'm going to pause here because I forgot to deliver a content warning, but there is some swear words. <laughs> Um, the <laughs> um, this honest reputation whispered of around the cells described a man of painstaking deliberations while not being overly burdened by supreme legal talent. He was also the son of a whore. This was evident by her decision to also name her son William. He asked, Master Swallow, do you understand the charge? These are hanging offences. I understand. Will found confidence despite the cavernous pit which had in mere seconds eroded away his stomach. He'd show no fear before the men who sought to erase him, men whose pounds of muscle were worth no more than his own. Someone behind Will spat. He felt the glob catch him in the back of the hair, followed by a low slurry of words meant for his ears only. You goddamn bastard swallow, go bugger yourself to hell. That sounded like the rich poetry of George Davis. 
the one man for which Will's heart would not bleed. If not for Davis, the Cypress would still be afloat, and none of them in chains. Yet Davis was not incorrect in his summary of Will's person. But if the older man felt betrayed by Will's regression, perhaps he best add naivety to his own list of failings. If there was a way to escape this pattern, Will would have done so long ago. When they wrote the ballad of his deeds, he would not unpromise tragedy. He'd left little room for tender betrayal, so actively he'd tossed aside others as if they'd been ill-fitting hats. A man who had not watched his children grow could not be called a father. A man who had not seen, who'd seen his crew perish could not be celebrated as a captain. All that was possibly left to him were the threads of a man who could not be pinned down, the convict who could not be held, the bird who could not be caged. For mutiny was in his blood, and it called to him as sweetly as the siren's whisper. Thank you for coming tonight. Hi, thanks for having me, Ali. Thank you for coming and listening to everyone. And, yeah. um, so, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your creative pursuits outside of writing. Um, okay, um, my name is Libby Hyatt. Um, I'm an artist. Um, I'm I'm very creative. So there's so I've got like art, writing, and music, and so that's sort of what I, I don't really sort of know how to talk about myself. It's just sort of what I do. Um, no, that's yeah, excellent. I think, I think I'm stuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, is your Facebook? public or you have a public uh, yeah, Instagram? It's, it's public, yeah. yeah. Work, if you yeah. find Libby on Instagram, she posts image of all her paintings. They're beautiful, so you can check those out. That's <laughs> it. Libby Hyatt, Hyatt with an E. So <laughs> I, you know, obviously I don't want to get people to follow me or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, you do, <laughs> <laughs> um, So it's the start of 2021. Um, why do you apply for the West Woods Academy? It's just it's just an opportunity that that I saw, so I'm, I'm just like okay, I'm going for it, um, you know. Which which I, I you know typically as uh, as part of uh, my business, as it were, I apply for opportunities when I've, I'm either doing the artwork itself or the writing or whatever it is, or I'm applying for opportunities. And the hit rate with getting opportunities that you apply for it's got to be about one in twenty, one in twenty five. So if you get one that sticks, such as this one, it yeah it. It, it pays for itself with all of the time you put in. Yeah. And can you speak to what you felt you got out of the academy? Well, I listened to you earlier talking about the networking and how that how that was one of the one of the things that that you really get from it. Um, and, and I thought, yeah, okay, what she said. Great. Was there a major work you were? Developing yes. last year. Yeah, I've really only been working on one one artwork as a writer, um, which is a, a young adults novel. I've been working on it for fifteen years, so I've done seven rewrites, and and that's what I'm going to be reading today. Um, yeah, I, I finished uh, my last rewrite over over the year, and now I'm uh, now I'm sort of drafting. So the the uh, the chapter one I'm I'm reading to you. Um, it's it's becoming quite tight now. Like I'm starting to really like I sort of I read it over and I think oh like I feel really good about what I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> so that's but I mean I've been sitting here feeling like oh you know I don't know about reading it reading it out loud. But um, but certainly when I read it over to myself I think oh, this is what I've been reaching for. And can you speak to some of the themes? What is it about you that this story is important? Um. Okay, well, I'll tell you a little bit about it. it it's called Fire Dance. Um, it's a novel about some some teenagers who are, you know, 15, 16, 17, um, going going hiking, which is one of the things I really love. And um, they're, well, whilst they're out hiking, it's a multi-day hike, they get impacted by bushfire. Um, and that's just, it's always been something that I've been like, oh, what happens if you're out hiking and a bushfire comes? And um, it, um, you know, I, as I was growing up, I, would, I really loved John Marsden's books. So um, the feeling of reading the books, that's been something which probably motivated me in, in what I wa in wanting to write. I wanted to write something that felt to read, you know, that, that you, know, you know, you read for escapism primarily probably. So that's, 
Yeah. Every time I've heard you describe the work, I think of John Marsden stuff. Well, honestly, so, you, yeah, that's <laughs> such, such, an, such an influence on our generation. Yeah. Honestly. yeah. Um, without further ado, then, I'd like to invite you for your reading. Okay. Um, Fire Dance, Chapter One. I didn't know what I was starting when I set out to do it, and I didn't know where it would lead me. Maybe there comes a point in your life where you get to choose what you go through, and maybe I was there. Spud was up first that morning. I remember realising it was Spud because he fell over me getting out of the tent. To save on pack weight, we've decided to leave the smaller tent in Chelsea's car and cram the five of us into Spud's three-man dome. We left the outer fly cover off because the night had been clear and warm. After Spud woke me up, I just laid there, <coughs> lazily watching the sky come to life with early light and the glowing sky emerging behind hands of leaves of loose-limbed trees. I felt like a drowsy baby, smiling herself awake in her cot, the towering trees, my loving parents peering over the cradle. I just want watermelon, mumbled Chelsea. I think she was sleep talking because she spoke with a foreign accent. <laughs> On her other side, Jono yawned and stretched and rolled over. I grinned in the dark. Jono had been hoping to share a mattress with Chelsea for some time. I struggled up. It's no easy job fumbling in low light, feeling for your socks and jumper in a space the size of an unlit bar fridge. My family had had its share of camping holidays when I was younger, but I must have forgotten how hard it is to do things crouched over in a tent. Or maybe mum and Cole and my older sisters had just done everything for me. I'm the youngest. It was my final year of high school, and I planned this hike having tweaked with short, sharp sorrow that my family may have outgrown camping trips. Not that I was majorly into camping trips, but I felt a pang feeling I'd dropped something by the side of the track, which I'd intended to return for, but the window had passed. I tried to recall the last hike we'd done as a family. Had it been the trip to the Warren Bungles when I was 12? No, to the Snowy Mountains. I'd been 15. That's right. Jenny and Louise didn't come. Our camping holiday to the snow didn't involve any snow aside from dirty winter leftovers on the highest slopes because we went during the summer school holidays before I started year 10. Rather than dropping camp in one place, we'd spent five days hiking. We'd spent five days hiking the 10 highest peaks of Australia. Maddie and Cole were the only people who actually hiked the whole distance. On about the third day, Mum and I staged a mutiny, keeping a tent and some food for ourselves and refusing to hike another step. It had worked out fine. Cole had adapted the route, so both he and Maddie, neither of whom were keen to sit around doing nothing, had bagged the 10 peaks before re returning to us for the trek out. Maddie, who was two years older than me, had held it over my head for a little while, then just seemed to forget. There was no slacking out of this hike in the Wollongandy wilderness because it had been my idea. I was the youngest of our group of five, aside from my best friend Chelsea, and I really wanted to prove myself. We were pretty close to home, just north of the Blue, of the Blue Mountains in the Wollamai National Park. After school yesterday afternoon, Chelsea and I had met the others at Jono's. Then the five of us squished into Chelsea's bug of a Yaris and hit the road. Over the next hour, westbound on Bell's line of road, I'd become fairly closely acquainted with Spud and Aya in the back seat. It had been nearly dark when we parked off the highway at a derelict looking train station. I noted with irony our nervous energy and the quick decisions we made, the same decisions we'd sweated over as a committee a few days prior. <coughs> For instance, leaving behind the extra tent in the car and walking only as far as the basin before dropping camp. Originally, we planned to go further and camp at the top of Mount Muscle so we could watch the sunrise. Should I keep going? Because I'm only halfway through. <laughs> okay. Um, after it got dark, I'd been using the flashlight app on my phone to light my way. At first I teased the others for springing head torches, which made them look like opal mines. But after I fell and sprained my left ankle and cracked my phone screen, I ran out of ammo. Possibly it's that one early decision which set the wheels in motion. If we were to put the blame on something, I mean not blame, but reason, let's say we should have held tight to our original plan. <coughs> or maybe not. I've always been known for my magnanimity and it's comforting to analyse disaster because it restores the illusion of control. Maybe the fire was going to find a way to burn, whether we started it or something else did. After all, the reason it blazed so bright and long and hard 
and catastrophically was because there was fuel to feed it. We reasoned the climb would be less arduous in the morning when our packs were relieved of the weight of dinner and breakfast. We erected the tent, built a campfire, cooked our pizza pockets and sat around cuddling each other and talking and looking at the stars. The next morning I was awake in a fresh new world. I exited the tent flat into the semi-dark. A magpie warbled, breaking the still morning dawn, and in answer a kookaburra gargled from deep in its throat. I wondered how like birds humans are. First thing in the morning, groups of, of humans get chirpy and chittery, or at least the humans I know sure do. I wasn't feeling chatty. I lumbered around, feeling my way, dumping the contents of my pack on the ground, swearing when I lost my balance, putting my shoes on, possibly tripping over the tent rope at some stage. I'm not sure, my memory's vague. I woke up when I walked into a wet spider's web. Only after I'd slapped at my face frantically did I remember our saying from primary school, web in the air, no need to beware. Yep, if my memory served me correctly, spiders who make their webs up high are safe. Ground-dwelling spiders are bastards. <laughs> I continued following my nose downhill. The noise of the waterfall and the smoky prickle of the campfire drew me. When I got closer, I heard the, the crinkly crackle of flames and further away a dull roar, the waterfall. And we'd extinguished the fire before going to sleep. So Spud must have lit this one, I don't know, at least half an hour ago. It takes a while for fires to become established. Um, I sat down, enjoying the solitude. The silver lake rippled brightly through dark tree trunks. Its feeder, tree, its feeder creek started flowing up near where we'd begun walking the day before. It fell in a waterfall to this lake. It wasn't a true lake, but I, I don't really know how to describe this water basin. It was a natural dam, bulging out of its watercourse system like a bloated belly. The creek below the barrier was a mere trickle until other, tributary, other tributaries joined downstream. I'd been feeling a bit clingy about wanting to lock my experience of the morning in my mind, if clingy is the right word for it. I was feeling pangs of haughtiness because this moment was going to pass and could never be repeated again in my life. I watched a bird flying over the shining <coughs> water, a small black silhouette skimming close to the surface, a sparrow probably. It ascended and circled before swooping startlingly close to Spud who I suddenly surprisingly saw standing at the water's edge. Spud ba barely flinched at the sparrow and I marvelled at his nerve. Maybe the bird trusted him because he'd been patient and peaceful, or maybe it was just protecting a nest of babies nearby. Then Spud coughed up a gross sounding bluegy and I forgot to be introspective. <laughs> I was reminded of Chelsea's rechristening of the Wollongambi wilderness. The Wanahoka Loogie Wilderness. <laughs> because I lived at Glossodia, she would call me a gloss vegan. I thought the, the joke hysterical the first time I heard it. <laughs> it was light enough for me to make out the folded heap at Spud's feet, which I realised was a sleeping human. A sleeping human on a lilo. A sleeping Aya on a lilo. We teased the crap out of her when we discovered instead of a sleeping mat, Aya had bought a lilo. In my foggy early morning brain, I realised Aya had slept outdoors last night, and now Spud was surreptitiously moving her lilo closer and closer to the water's edge. I thought Spud knew I was watching him. There was something imperfectly unguarded in his swift motions. He moved with a sort of self-awareness, as though he was watching himself from afar and found something about his performance ironic. Aya had been a late addition on the trip a replacement for Jono's twin brother, Van, who'd gotten himself grounded. Jono and Aya were 18, Spud and I were 17, and Chelsea was 16. We'd been strongly advised by the powers that be, Mum and Cole in my situation, Chelsea's mum in hers, that we could forget going hiking anywhere except to Windsor Mall if we had less than five people, and no more than eight, which by law was the maximum group size allowed in wilderness areas. I'd spoken with Aya in the group chat, but we hadn't met face to face until leaving for the hike. Her short pink hair caught me off guard because I'd pictured her as her avatar with a brown ponytail. My sister Maddie had short pink hair and she was always getting on my nerves, singing the same phrase over and over again. Not the same song, mind you, just the same eight bar phrase on repeat. The set list varied with the day. I couldn't really do anything about it except move to a different room or ask her to move because she was diagnosed with PTSD and her counsellor said it was self-soothing behaviour. <laughs> <laughs>
Aya slept with her hand over her mouth. She looked a lot younger sleeping like that. Spud jumped when he saw me. Perhaps he hadn't realised I'd been there. His face spread into a conspiratory grin. I'd heard of pranks like these. My stepdad, Cole, had told us about how his mates had dragged him inch by inch on his swag into the middle of the cricket pitch one night. Mum had commented that to have slept through it, he must have been tanked to the eyeballs. Cole had not been forthcoming. Anyway, I just seemed to be a naturally heavy sleeper. When I realised she was completely oblivious, I got the giggles. I couldn't help myself. The harder she slept, the more urgently I had to force back my laughter. I envisioned Aya blissfully drifting away downstream. It seemed utterly ridiculous that she would sleep through, given that Spud and I were not exactly quiet. Well, Spud was pretty quiet. I wasn't very quiet. Although I got wet to the waist, it was worth it. Spud and I worked together without talking, pushing and pulling in gentle movements. Probably sabotaged his rhythm occasionally, earning myself the evil eye, but we managed to push Aya out on her lilo into the water without waking her. Spud tugged at my sleeve, like, let's get out of here. I exploded with laughter on the run. Bessie, shut up, shh. You need to learn the fine art of deception. Come with me up Mount Muscle. I was going there anyway. Leave the scene of the crime, I said. Oh, good call, handed Spud. Were you gonna take that? He looked at my discarded tin billy. Oh yeah, I meant to get some water. <coughs> oh, that's cool, take mine. Will you have coffee, tea, or bonox? We were still pretty hyper and unburdened without packs, streaks like lean border collies up the slope. When I rounded the top of the hill after Spud, the view made my breath catch tight on its way out. The sight of the sunrise imprinted on my mind. The slash of red sandstone cliffs stretched starkly over the mouth of a deep, dark moor, smiling up at the sky, showing red teeth gleaming at each end. The softly marbled sky progressed irreversibly as the minute hand on a clock. I've forgotten most of my other senses now that lifted me so high. I do recall the feel of the wind and the crystal sound of birds, but I kind of have to add them in post-production. I spontaneously expressed my exhilaration by squealing and jumping with delight, reaching up to Spud from behind to press myself against him in a little hug. I recall my transparency at that age with shame. My secret thoughts ruminated silently inside my mind in an ever-expanding spiral unspoken but readable, clear as day on my face. But the truth is, I knew my secrets were not so secret. I was just pretending to have no idea. I remember the snug touch of Spud's arms around me from behind, keeping me safe from falling into the endless depth of distance beyond. And I remember my shocked delight when he moved me in front of him and anchored his arms around me possessively. I suppose he felt me melt against him, but he couldn't see me close my eyes and surrender. Honestly, I think the only thing keeping me from floating away completely was the weight of his arms. We stood still for so long it got kind of awkward. I was trying not to move, lest Spud imagine I was rejecting him. This would have been the perfect place to have scattered Dad's ashes, all together in one go, not a bit here and a bit there, and a bit of Penrith bloody footy ground, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know this side existed when I was choosing where my crumbled, dusty allotment of my father's body was to go. I was six. I scattered Dad's ashes in the river. Underneath the dazzling red rock was the dark jaw of the valley. Shadows within shadows. I longed to identify our path. The mountains seemed so otherworldly, and I needed context to normalise them. We should have brought the map up. Imperfect black, scrunching towards green. Black chinks in the red cliff face, underscoring the magnificent flight of light. It was kind of a natural progression for us to point out a spot on the rock for building a fire. Then seeing we could jump down to a rock in front and discovering it backed into a shallow short cave, we chose that spot to start our fire. I had a box of matches and Spud had a lighter. At home it had been my job to light the fireplace in winter since we moved there since I was 11. I was supposed to change out of my school uniform before sitting on the brick hearth. Spoiler alert, that didn't always happen. Starting a fire is easy. It wants fuel, oxygen and heat, and when conditions are met, they combust. The secret to building a good, a good fire is airflow. You start with the smallest size twigs possible, and somehow space them apart so there can be air underneath. Spud wanted to build a teepee with the kindling, but I knew a better way. 
dropping a medium girth twig across the cold fireplace, then resting tiny twigs against it like a lean-to. In the end, Spud and I compromised and built a ramshackle nest of twigs of various sizes. We probably wasted more wood than we needed to. I was always up for conserving firewood because bringing up the logs from the woodshed had been part of my chore. But we were at least restrained waiting for the fire to really take hold before adding extra twigs. You can't overload a young fire with unwarmed wood too soon because it might go out. Spud was cracking me up telling dirty jokes. I can't remember exactly what. Now, something about a tampon and a cockatoo. <laughs> Maybe by then Spud had already seen me as extraordinary and was deliberately working on me to show me. See, I've done well by not even joking myself. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe by then, Spud had already seen me as extraordinary and was deliberately working on me to show me he was extraordinary too. Very, 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 very intentionally, ever so nonchalantly, reaching for his talents to parade them before me one by one. Maybe, no, maybe that's what I was doing for him. My memory blurs up now, but can the golden glory of discovery ever really dim? It hasn't, it won't, it can't, it doesn't. The sun rises every morning. Gorgeous. Lovely to have you here. Thank you. Um, so, the usual question <laughs> to start of 2021, why do you apply to the Westwards again? So, I believe I applied for another thing with Westwards and I didn't get that, the Emerging Rise Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And Michael suggested, if I was interested in doing that one, that the um, position was available for me to have. So I was like, yes, definitely, <laughs> anything. Um, so yeah, that's how it came about for me. Oh, excellent. Um, and um, tell us about your writing craft before, your creative pursuits before you joined the academy. Um, so I basically only, I started writing long form fiction, any kind of like short stories, anything in 2019. And um, I was working on a novella called Nadir, um, and that got me into Verena House through Westwards. So that was my main focus for that amount of time. And then I think lockdown hit, and I came up with this idea, which is what I'll be reading. And um, I worked on it, I wrote it initially as a novella, very draft, very, um, basically an outline, really. Um, and I worked on it in another mentorship program. And then, um, yeah, I was like, I want this to be a novel. <laughs> so I started doing that. But to be honest, I virtually didn't write last year. Because of lockdown, yeah, multitude of reasons. Yeah. I edited a bit. I wrote uh, the living stories, short story. Yes, and yeah. that's pretty much it. So this was the last thing I wrote. Right. But I've been re-energized, and I think um, what we did last year had a lot to do with it. And oh, yeah, it's definitely given me a new perspective on. And you're yeah. revisiting this particular work. That you're yes, working? this is chapter three. So just to give a bit of context. It's a flashback, um, and it, yeah, it's a flashback set in, I guess, 2006, and it's about a sister and her parents visiting her brother who's in hospital, and I guess, do you want me to mention the content warnings? Yeah. Yes. 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 There's mentions of suicide, and there's swearing ones, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, just to let you guys know. Um, yeah, so it's about, it's <coughs> about a Greek family, and it's, there's a bit of Brickness in it, yeah. Um, just, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's called Gallagher. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yes, take yeah. it away. His roommate had called me, saying he took a bunch of pills and had to get his stomach pumped. I remember first seeing him in emergency, the metronomic beeping of the machines, his fi eyes finally opening, life emerging slowly from the haze. He was out of it for a few hours or a few days. I couldn't be sure. Time warped and I couldn't trust my account of it. When I told my mom and Baba there was a good chance he wasn't going to make it, they finally came to see their son for the first time in six years. They'd sat in silence, waiting for me in the salon. My mom had a box resting on her lap. I didn't think much of it at the time, assuming it was food she prepared. When they finally laid eyes upon their son, properly a man now, with a few days growth on his face, aging him even to me, I realized what was in the box. My mom had ransacked the church. That was the only explanation. There were photos of icons and saints I didn't know existed, enough for Molia for the entire hospital staff. She led Livani and began blessing the room, singing a song like she was part of the clergy. <laughs> Despite my warnings, the, the hospital staff might come. 
or that the Levani might suffocate Michael, who was hooked up to a menagerie of machines, she continued blessing the room. Babak placed a photo of Jesus in front of his medical chart. He began hammering nails into the wall to hang wooden frames of godly things above Michael's head. He had strewn the beads on every nook and cranny. He hung a gun below on Michael's limp hand like he was part of the furniture, and I broke. He's not actually dying anymore. Jesus fucking Christ, I lied. They both stopped what they were doing and stared at me. Then at Michael. Hi, Ma. Hi, Ba. Michael croaked, taking off his oxygen mask. To this day, my mom and Baba think it was a miracle. I learned <laughs> that if someone wanted to believe in a miracle, nothing would sway them. No matter how many times Michael or I told them he'd woken earlier that day, or that Michael had played comatose while they adorned the room to dodge the same ceremony they sit with sweat on a hot summer's day, I knew they weren't angry at him anymore, just accustomed to being that way. Michael had attempted to overdose, that part was real, and I wanted our family to be whole again. Seconds after Michael's resurrection, Mama was sprawled across his bed crying, cupping his face. Baba stood further back, stroking Michael's leg and every so often giving it a rough but affectionate slap. I leaned against the doorway, watching my last six birthday wishes come true. When Mama went outside for a smoke, I watched Michael get gullible for the first time in over six years. Growing up, we were used to sharing. It was all we knew. But the way my face flushed a blaze at the spectacle before me told me that sharing was a habit not innately human, at the very least, not innate to me. Michael always told me it was better when I was there, so I stayed. I white knuckled the arms of the plastic chair I was sitting in as Mama coaxed him into it. We all knew he wanted a galagoo, but didn't want to admit it. He had outgrown it in the last six years. He was a man now. One that didn't need his Mama Baba. His distance made him more confident of these truths, but not so much he didn't need me to believe them as well. We twin Gomadaria from a bottle, passing it back and forth, slumped on his couch talking about our childhood and how much had changed since. He was fixated in the past, like if he thought about it hard enough, he could change it. I'd grown up since Michael had left too, but without the pretense that I'd, I'd outgrown my mum baba. Michael hadn't grown up, he'd gone away. Like muscle memory, he reverted back to his old self at my mum and baba's embrace then, taking off the costume of what he thought a man ought to be, that he picked up over the years as a weapon and protected for his orphan life. It didn't take long for him to succumb to Mama's will. Mythical images transposed onto Liverpool Hospital. I, sitting alone, was engulfed by a circle of flames. My skin sweating beads as the hospital became Hades. Demonic creatures holding pitchforks with swollen male appendages poked at me, and their prongs made my head throb rather than make my skin bleed. Swarms of birds feasted on my liver while my ankle was shackled to a ball of steel and I was made to trudge up a mountain with it only to go back down again and repeat. Across the room I was blinded by gleaming light and crisp white sheets. Pieta in happier times. Fluffy pillows abound like cotton balls of comfort. They were dressed in all white and halos encircled their heads that illuminated the room brilliant. My eyes focused on the white that trickled down Michael's chin. I narrowed my eyes at him, but his were closed. I was withering away, like he was sucking the life out of me and not the milk out of my mom. Thank you for joining us. Um, please tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, who you are outside of your creative pursuits. Well, I am a mother and grandmother, which I always say first because these are the most important roles in my life. Otherwise, I am a, a very recently retired psychiatrist, which, uh, you know, you had there in the questions, uh, what are our creative pursuits? I think that being a, a psychotherapist uh, was the most creative thing that I did in my life, having to constantly follow the, my, uh, the, the other person mm -hmm. trying to guide them without a script. Mm -hmm. It's very creative. But, but <laughs> <laughs> in addition, I always wrote, but as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And you are probably going to ask me a question why I yes. joined <laughs> 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 And yeah. I did it because uh, it offered a possibility of shifting from being a hobby writer mm -hmm. to being a writer and it allowed you treating me seriously, allowed me to 
shift from my identity as a doctor to an identity also as a writer was, was actually quite a difficult shift. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and you fulfill your promise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent, I'm glad. Um, so tell us a little bit about the piece um, you were working on during the Academy. Oh. So I, I have several projects, <laughs> one of them being an essay, to a, a, a pair of hands that was published, which is my first uh, so far only publication, but still it's the beginning. Mm -hmm. And otherwise my biggest project is a series of short stories linked by a character of a young doctor, surprise, <laughs> 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 called Sophia. <laughs> who, um, as, as she progresses through her career and her professional career and life. And it's, uh, writing these stories enables me to come to some sense and conclusions of uh, my, my professional life in which I had the privilege of being touched by probably thousands of people's lives. And I hope so it, it's really helping me to somewhat put it in a perspective. At the same time, I hope that future writers will feel validated, and if not validated, at least have their curiosity about life's third. Excellent. And as I understand it, the piece you will be performing for us tonight is a very different <laughs> piece to what you just <laughs> described. <though. laughs> you know, it's a piece that sort of happened uh, it's, a, it's one of the scenes of a play which I wrote sort of on the side. The, the title of the piece of the scene, which is in the middle of the play, it's Trouble on Earth. And the whole play has the title uh, Celestial Canteen or the Bells, Hells, Hells Bells Bar and Grill. <laughs> <laughs> from the corridors of heavens. Mm -hmm. So just to highlight, because there is something in that scene that comes from the other, one of the minor things of the play is the tension between heavens and hell because uh, the celestial canteen only serves nectar of ambrosia and mm -hmm. manna from heaven, <laughs> while the Hell's Bells Bar and Grill offers <laughs> cool cocktails, hip music, mm. and quicksand. <laughs> <laughs> but God is very conservative. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so the, just one last sentence, two sentences. <laughs> um, so the, the, the play is an epic journey through time and space, starting from the dawn of creation and ending with its end. Oh. But don't worry, because that's in the middle of, the, we are going to be in the middle of the play. <laughs> the doomsday is far away, and you are going to be in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Father, nobody can sleep with all these mosquitoes around. Don't mind mosquitoes. Something is very amiss on the earth. Come here and have a look. Can you see? Whereabouts? What am I supposed to be looking at? Can't you see? Just look. On earth, wherever you look, there is moaning and groaning and human life expanding with exorbitant speed. Well, that's nothing new. That's been the case for quite a while, hasn't it? Yes, yes, but no, not like this. I tell you, Jesus, something is wrong, very wrong. Oh, I, I can see now. The earth, it's so crowded. Yes, I can see. The crowds of humans everywhere I look, and they don't seem to be very happy at all. Not happy at all. <laughs> no, they are not happy. 
I can hear the moans and cries of pain. And there are so many of them. Let me have a better look. Yes, Jesus, look, look at that grouping. According to my accounts, they were supposed to die a while ago. I'm <laughs> <laughs> sure of that. They are so old and not functioning. What's keeping them alive? <laughs> What's going on? I don't know, Father. And look over there. So many babies are being born at the same time. No wonder the earth is becoming crowded. Well, we'll have to... Security alert! Security alert! Security alert! Let me check what's going on. Hand me the laptop, please. Let me get the sight of... Aha! There is a breach of security in the Garden of Eden. Yes, Garden of Eden. A suspected alien being. I bet it's Satan. I bet it's him. Oh, <laughs> if I get him in my hands, I... You need to calm down, Father. Calm down. Let's go and check first, and then we'll know. Let's run to the Garden of Eden. I cannot run. I'm already past just walking. <laughs> then I'll run first, and... No, you won't. I won't have you with Satan alone. Understand? I wish you trusted me more, Father. I trust you, son, but I don't trust Satan. He's very clever, you know. He's always been bright, so promising. <laughs> what a pity. <laughs> but never mind. He's now using his intellect only to play tricks. Even I can get some time. Father, I just had a thought. Uh, sorry to interrupt. So sorry. Um, <laughs> what about the tree of life? Mm. The tree of life? What if someone stole the fruit from... Jesus, my son, you are probably <laughs> right. What a disaster. Let's go to the tree of life. Look, here is the tree of life. And am I imagining it? Or is there something white amongst the branches? It doesn't look like Satan. The tree has such lush big leaves. It's hard to see. Oh, shake it. Hey, 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 stop this! Careful! I could fall down and break my bones! Stop shaking, my son. <laughs> Death, what are you doing there, sitting <laughs> in the tree of life? Oh, just resting, my lord. <laughs> I got really tired of the grim harvest. <laughs> my scythe got blunt. That's easily fixed. Jesus can sharpen your scythe, can't you, Jesus? Listen, Death. People are not dying as they should. It's not a good time for a rest. You have a job to do. With respect, my lord, it's not my problem. <laughs> I'm sick of people. <laughs> if you are sick of humans and killing them, it's an easy option. <laughs> <laughs> not in my position. It's hard work, you know. My arms are sore. My back is sore. I'm sore all over. I don't understand. You've been doing this job since the beginning of life. Why now? Since the beginning of life, yeah. That's exactly why I'm so tired. <laughs> Besides, nobody appreciates my work. Nobody, even you, my lord. I don't get any praise. Or a pay rise for that matter. <laughs> you can discuss this with the HR department. I have to with them because I do appreciate your work. I need it badly. Without you right now, the earth is groaning under the mass of humanity. Old and sick and suffering without end. Truly, if you resume your duties, you'll be appreciated by all. Appreciated by all, my lord? You just don't understand. Humans! They beg, plead me to come, and when I do, they refuse to go. <laughs> they hate me. You wouldn't believe how much they hate me. They curse and abuse me. I don't want this anymore. I'm done. Would it help if I sent a pandemic? <laughs> 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 Suffering without end, without end, sounds like hell to me. I 
can smell Jesus. Stop whispering in my ear. I can hear what you. What are you saying about Satan? Rustling in the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> Ow! Get off my tail, would you? Get off my tail, Jesus! <laughs> I'm not going to. Show yourself, Satan. Come out of the bushes, you coward! Well, well, Satan. Fancy meeting you here in the Garden of Eden near the Tree of Life. I knew you were likely to have caused this upheaval. I just wanted to do good, my lord. I promise. I thought humans would be better off without dying. <laughs> I am not stupid, Satan, and either are you. Just arrogant. By creating suffering without end, you wanted to bring hell to earth, didn't you? Satan, you are such a menace. What do I do with you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about it some more, but for now, let him go, Jesus. Let him go? Did you say let him go? Father, you're mistaken. I don't want to let him go. He'll immediately cause another problem. Why don't you destroy Satan? Annihilate him. Son, you should know by now. I cannot annihilate Satan. Because everything that is needs to continue existing to, in one form or another to maintain the consistency of energy and measure of the universe. Satanic energy will remain, just take a different form. And better the devil you know as this. <laughs> Besides, like death, even Satan has a role to play. So let him go. And your death, <laughs> you come down to earth and do your job. Would you really want to remain up there in the tree for the rest of eternity? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my tail! You have injured my tail! I pleased, I did. Stop this, Jesus. <laughs> now, I'll stay here and you go and tell Archangel Michael to come and escort this pair out of the Garden of Eden. I'm so tired. Heavens, I need a drink. <laughs> Perhaps in the meantime, Satan might give me some tips on what to add to the drinks menu of the celestial canteen. Finally, I am sold on change. <laughs>